Occupational English Test Listening Test This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hi Peter, how are you? My name's Rose and I'm looking after your two babies today. How are you? Oh, hi Rose, I'm, I'm very well, thanks. Yeah. Um, so this is, must come as a bit of a shock to you, this, um, the birth of your babies four weeks early today? Yes, we, we weren't prepared for it, um, I suppose. Um, yeah, we... Um, sorry. That's okay. Um, it's, I know it's quite, it's quite overwhelming, isn't it, when you've come in today and this has all probably been a, a huge shock and a big surprise. Why don't you come and sit down next to um, your babies and I'll explain to you what we've done. Okay. Because um, your wife will be down in recovery probably for another hour or so. So let's look at your little girl first. Have you got a name for her yet? Yeah, this uh, is Olive. Oh, that's <laughs> lovely. Is that a family name? Or? Uh, it is, actually. It's uh, my, um, um, my wife's grandmother's name. Lovely. Yeah. So as you know, Olive is um, a little bit, well, you can see by looking at her, smaller than her brother. And uh, I guess the doctors would have spoken to you prior to the birth about why the babies needed to be delivered um, this four weeks early. Um, and so the concerns I guess we have for Olive are related to the fact that she is small and so she doesn't have a lot of reserve and that places her at um, risk of some potential problems, which is the reason she's up here in the nursery. Okay. Um, the most obvious of those is that she doesn't have a lot of fat to keep herself warm and therefore that's why we have her in an incubator. Um, and that basically creates a nice warm environment to keep her temperature stable because unlike her brother or even a term baby, she doesn't have a lot of uh, what we call brown fat, which she can use to keep herself warm. Okay. And yep. um, how long do you think she'll be in the incubator? We Usually most babies will come out when they're around 1,800 grams to 2 kilos, but that will really depend on her. So what we'll be aiming to do is to, um, once she's stable, start her on some feeds. Initially we'll give her some um, fluids intravenously. Um, and so once we can start to get some milk feeds into her and fatten her up, and once she's able to maintain her own temperature, she'll come out. So there's no set weight for that to happen. There's no set time for that to happen. It'll, it'll be a judgment call about how quickly she starts to maintain her own temperature and how quickly we can bring the incubator temperature down. Um, so, Peter, just take me back. I haven't had a chance to look through your wife's obstetric history. These were your first babies, is that right? Yes, that's yeah. right. Um, we found out quite early that we were we were having twins because mm -hmm. we had an, an early dating scan about five weeks, so mm -hmm. we've had plenty of time to sort of think about that yep. and, and prepare. And the pregnancy, um, it, we were told it was a, a high risk pregnancy because we're having twins, mm -hmm. um, but every, everything seems to have been normal. We've had regular doctors' appointments and. Scans. Mm -hmm. So your 18-week scan, the babies were both n growing normally, is that right? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. And in fact, I think it was at that point, um, the scans, I think, were, were getting um, quite stressful, <laughs> I yeah. think. Yeah, so of course. Because we thought things were quite normal, I think we missed a couple of scans 
Okay. After that. Okay. And so we we had the thirty five week scan, and yeah. we everything seemed normal, and my wife felt healthy. But then we had the scan, and I think the sonographer was quite um, worried, right? And so made us, or we went and, and saw the Into doctor panic immediately. Mode. Yeah. Um, yes, a little bit, and so um, the olive's placenta was a little bit um, sort of smaller and, yeah. and and used up it had um less less fluid in mm-hmm. it and um i think they were just concerned and so they thought we had to take the babies sure. out immediately yeah yeah so that would have been um, obviously quite alarming for you um did your wife get antenatal steroids um yes she did so we um so they arranged for um us to have a, a cesarean on friday to get okay. to get olive out and the next day, Wednesday, we went back in and Thursday and, yeah, my wife was given steroids and I think the uh, the baby's hearts were monitored as well Good. for quite a long time. So she had two doses of steroids? That's, That's right. fantastic, yes. yeah. And we can see that those have worked beautifully because Olive is not actually requiring any oxygen at all. Okay. We've just put a little, um, see a little light shining on Olive's foot there. That's called a pulse oximeter. And that's just measuring her oxygen saturation levels for us. And that and they're reading 99 at the moment. Yeah. She's having no problems with her breathing uh, and neither is her brother. And that would be one of our concerns at 35 weeks, that the lungs um, are still a little bit immature. And so some babies uh, will struggle to breathe by themselves even at 35 weeks. But your babies are doing beautifully. Well, that's and good. that's the steroids that has helped. Yeah. Um, I would say Olive will be unlikely to need oxygen, um, given how lovely she looks okay. now. Well, that's good. But we will do a blood test to check her oxygen levels. We'll just do a little prick of blood from her heel and send that off. Um, we can do that here on the ward, put it straight in the blood gas machine and check that she's doing okay. Okay. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, Complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Okay, so when was the last time you saw an optometrist? Uh, I would say about six months ago. Okay, great. So um, did you get a new pair of glasses then? Uh, No, no, I didn't. Okay, and are you wearing anything at the moment? Yes, yes, I've got glasses, which I got about a year ago. Okay, and what do you normally wear those glasses for? Uh, reading. Reading, okay. I generally don't wear them, uh, you know, for distance. Okay, great. So you're, are you happy with how you see in the distance? Uh, yes, I don't have a problem there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, that it's getting a bit more difficult for reading, okay. especially small print. The, mm-hmm. the phone book, for example, is... is really difficult for me. Yeah, well, the phone book is difficult anyway, I think. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, that can certainly be quite frustrating. Yes. So do you think the difficulty was there when you got your most recent glasses a year ago or do you think it's gone downhill since then? I think that my uh, vision in my good eye is not as good as it was 12 months ago. Okay. All right. So let's tell me about your um, eye history then. Yes, well, <clears throat> it goes back quite a bit. Uh, around about 06, mm-hmm. uh, I started to notice a slight waviness in lines that I was reading. Okay. And so that was in your right eye? In my right eye. Okay. And the ophthalmologist um, said, you know, you've got a problem with your right eye. You should see uh, a specialist, mm-hmm. a retinal specialist. Mm-hmm. So 
that was organised by about, uh, I don't know, late 06, maybe into 07. Okay. Um, the specialist did a scan mm-hmm. and decided that, you know, there was uh, an accumulation of fluid in the uh, front of the retina. Okay. Uh, and uh, prescribed a uh, lucentis mm-hmm. uh, injection. Mm-hmm. That was done monthly mm-hmm. for, I think, uh, about two years. Okay. Until I eventually uh, changed over to the eye and ear, mainly because it was costing quite sure. a bit. So <clears> how often <throat> are you seeing the specialist at the eye and ear now? Uh well, I used to see them initially about three monthly, yes. but now it's about six monthly. Great, okay. So is there someone that you see there specifically, or are you just sort of going through the public clinic? Uh, the public clinic, but in the uh, the retinal clinic that I attend, there are about three doctors, and I see one or other of those three. Okay, so you are getting that continuum of care. Oh, yes, Great. Yes. And... Are they fairly happy with how stable that right eye is at the moment? Well, I think they are disappointed that uh, it was not successful. Mm. I mean, it's... um, I think I've had something like 25 injections of lucentis. yeah. And um, to think that, you know, I've lost central vision in the right eye... Mm. Um, they're not too happy about that. Mm-hmm. But um, the last scan they did, uh, there was no fluid there. Great. So um, uh, I presume it's just a, a wait and watch now and see That's what right. uh, yeah see what uh, eventuates. So are you aware of what the Amsler chart does? Uh, yes, um, I've been using it for. Some some years now. Okay, so I'll just run through it just to make sure that you're you're doing it properly because a lot of people do it every day and they don't realise they're not doing it properly and as a result, you know, it there's no point. So um, it basically checks the very very cen- central visual field um, of of both eyes. Um, So it's really important that you cover one eye when you're doing it. The main thing when you're doing that Amsler chart is not to really look for those little nitty-gritty things, but to gauge any significant change. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. Michael Juarez, he's a 64 year old here with onset AFib, a history of type two diabetes and a stage two wound on his left sacrum. He's allergic to penicillin. He's married and lives at home with his wife, who has Alzheimer's. He's alert and oriented times two, and he's unable to ambulate independently. OT worked with him yesterday. He responds verbally. We're actively titrating his amiodarone drip. His lungs are clear. His blood sugar was high before breakfast, and he got seven units of insulin. His last bowel movement was two days ago. Uh, He's retaining urine due to BPH. Uh, He's on a cardiac diet and is due for a stress test at 10. Did you get all that? Wow, this is a heavy load. I better get started. There's a new admit coming from the ED. It's your turn to take it. He's come into room 346, and the nurse will be calling with report. Okay, thank you. Good luck.
Question 26. Now read the question. Do you need something? Yeah, I think I'm going to need some help with my patients today. All right. Okay, I just sat down. Give me a minute. I don't understand these new nurses. They don't want to work hard. They think everything should be given to them. That we should just stop what we're doing and help them. This place is going to send me to an early grave. I've had to precept all these new nurses and manage 40 beds. We never have enough experienced nurses. And now our patient satisfaction scores are way down. I'm tired. Question 27. Now read the question. When I asked you for help earlier this morning, you seemed a bit upset and overwhelmed. I know we've been very busy on the unit and we got slammed this morning, but um, the response made me feel demeaned and a little embarrassed. It's important for me to feel supported and respected when I ask for help. And with your help, I know I can be a great nurse, I can support the unit and you, and we can together better care for our patients. I am so sorry, Jaslyn. I did not intend to make you feel bad. It's been a crazy morning. Besides everything here, I got a call that my mom fell at the nursing home. No. And you know, I got all those monthly reports due at the end of the day. I do value you, and I will remember that. Let's get going. Question 28. Now read the question. Hi, Dr. Walker. Yes, this is Carolyn Hall. I'm calling um, concerning Virginia Woolf in 347B. She's a para one, gravita one, and she has a massive amount of bleeding that saturated that, that saturated her bed and is pooling on the floor. Yes, and right now she's unresponsive and her blood pressure is 86 over 40. Her heart rate is 122, her respirations is 12, and her O2 sat is 90% on room air. Yes, she had an un uncomplicated vaginal delivery this morning and we gave her some Percocet and Ambient about 90 minutes ago. She has a saline lock on her, in her right arm and it looks like a hemorrhage and I think you should come and assess the patient. Okay. Question 29. Now read the question. Oh my gosh, what is wrong? What do you think is wrong with her? Uh, it's, it's not unusual. But why for, is she bleeding like this? Look at the blood on the floor. The nurse, uh, It's just awful. It's, it's not unusual for uh, a mom to have the baby and start oh. bleeding. This is not unusual. She's not talking to me at she all. Will, she'll talk. The nurse is calling the doctor. Okay. And sometimes after having a baby, uh -huh. the uterus is not contracting as it's supposed to. Uh -huh. That's what's going on. That's why okay. the primary nurse asked that I massage the abdomen okay. Do you so think that we we'll get her, it firm. Do you think we'll have to give her blood? Okay. okay, let me read that back to you. You said you want normal saline, one liter bolus, IV, O2 on a non-rebreather, and you want her to keep, our, keep her sats greater than 96. Question 30. Now read the question. This 
The situation is that a 42-year-old female with signs of chronic liver disease presented here about two hours ago with presyncopal symptoms after hematemesis and melina at home. On arrival, she was tachycardic and hypotensive, but responded well to fluids. We were working her up as a variceal bleed when she had this further large hematemesis. She's now looking shocked again, with a pulse of 110 and a BP of about 80 on 50, and we are about to start a unit of blood, a PPI and some octreotide. On exam, there is no evidence of ascites, so I haven't started antibiotics. And? No other background story known at this stage, other than 10 years of high alcohol intake of about 60 grams a day, and a 30-pack year history of smoking. She's not had much in the way of investigation for her disease yet, although she does say that her GP told her that drinking had caused severe damage. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. It's been estimated that around the world there are millions of people who are otherwise healthy, have never had a heart attack or stroke, are not at high risk of bowel cancer, yet who take aspirin on a daily basis, convinced that it's going to help them. Well, the evidence from the largest ever study in this area suggests not. A huge trial called ASPRI, involving healthy Australians and Americans aged over 70, given low-dose aspirin for five years, has found no benefits and some harms. The research was led by Professor John McNeil of the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University, who I spoke to before we went to air. Welcome to the Health Report, John. Thank you, Noah. It's pretty impressive, three papers in the New England Journal. What sparked this study? Because it was Australian motivated, even though it occurred in the United States as well. I think we've been aware since the 1990s that there's an evidence gap that many millions of people take aspirin every morning and the evidence base, particularly for those who haven't had a heart attack or a stroke or have no other medical reason to be taking it, the evidence just isn't there. So what did you do in this study? We recruited 19,100 people from the United States and Australia. 16,700 were from Australia and we followed them for an average of 4.6 years and half of them took aspirin and half of them took placebo. And what were you looking for? What were your endpoints? Well, the endpoint here was disability-free survival, which is a measure of how long elderly people stay healthy. But how did you measure that? By measuring how long it took for people to remain healthy without having a permanent physical disability or developing dementia. And what did you find? 
Well, we found three things. Firstly, low-dose aspirin did not appear to increase survival. Disability-free survival or survival? Disability-free survival and survival. And it also didn't prevent heart attack or stroke. I think I should emphasise that this study was done in people who'd never had a heart attack or a stroke because people who have routinely take aspirin under very strong evidence to prevent them having another one. So we're talking about healthy people recruited who are over 70 on average, is that right? That's right. The average age is 74. What about cancer? A lot of people take aspirin to prevent cancer and there is some randomised trial evidence that aspirin can prevent cancer. Yes, this was a surprising finding in our study. There were numerically more people dying of cancer in the uh, aspirin arm than in the placebo arm. This was a a relatively small effect. It wasn't statistically significant once we adjusted for the multiple comparisons that we were making, and it hasn't been seen in other large clinical trials. So we're suspending judgment as to what its significance really means. And what were the complications and the side effects? Well, we had the usual side effect of bleeding. We took a lot of care over the measurement of bleeding because older people are more inclined to bleed and aspirin enhances that effect. And we certainly had an increase in hemorrhage in the people taking aspirin. Now, previous studies have suggested, and we had this on the health report, I think it was last year, suggesting that if there was a hemorrhage risk, it was early on and that settled down later. We looked at this, but we couldn't find that. And according to our data, uh, the risk of hemorrhage just kept going. Now, we had a story not so long ago on the health report suggesting that the effect of aspirin, of low-dose aspirin, is actually only there in people who weigh 70 kilos or less. And that if you want to get an effect from aspirin, you should be on a higher dose, like 325 milligrams or even 600. We've had a brief look at that, and we couldn't find that in our older people. What about dementia? Aspirin appeared to have no effect at all on dementia. But four years is not a long time to develop dementia. I mean, did you measure cognitive decline? Yes, we measured cognitive decline very carefully. And we haven't analysed all the data yet, but certainly the number of people who were diagnosed with dementia was the same on each arm. But that raises a very important issue because we will be following the people who participated in a spree over the long term to see if there is a difference in incidence of dementia or cancer that appears later. And uh, we know that there's been evidence that cancer preventive effect does take four or five years before it becomes evident. That's one of the reasons why we've been very keen for our spree participants throughout both countries to continue to be involved and let us follow them up. Now, if you have hemorrhage or you have side effects like gastric upset or something like that from aspirin, the people who are taking the real thing might have dropped out more than people on the placebo. Did you, I mean, that could have affected the results? We did a lot of testing of how many people were taking aspirin. We counted their pill bottles and so on. And we found that basically there was very good compliance with the medication on both arms of the study. Could this be a phenomenon of as we are getting older we're actually not necessarily ageing, we're actually living longer, younger, and we're getting less heart disease. Was this population too young? Paradoxically, even though they were 75, were they actually too young to get an effect? Because 75 is, you know, is like the new 50, as they say. That's an interesting question. We followed people whose commencement average age was 74 and whose final average age was nearly 79. So that's following people through a reasonably long period. We had a number of people who were over 80 years of age. And as far as we could tell, there wasn't a really big difference between the impact of aspirin at any of these ages. So if somebody's taking aspirin now, they're entirely healthy, they've never had heart disease, they've not had bowel polyps, which is another reason why some people might take aspirin to prevent the polyps turning into cancer or new polyps emerging, and they're on aspirin, should they just stop? Look, we're not recommending this at this point. People taking aspirin take it for three reasons. I mean, some, of course, as you said, have had a heart attack or a stroke or something similar in the past, and they should definitely be on aspirin because the evidence is strong. And then there's others who've been put on aspirin by their doctors for a range of other reasons, and they should continue as well, certainly not stop without getting advice from their doctor. But then there's the third category who may have just decided, they've 
read somewhere, they're perfectly healthy, they think it's a good idea. The results of a, of a spree will lead those people to reconsider whether that's a good idea. Just finally, do we know the numbers of people who are taking aspirin unnecessarily? We know that it's much more common in the United States where about 40 per day strong. And Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Five years ago in Victoria, a baby died during a planned home birth. The coroner recommended an investigation into the extent of problems arising from home births. One of the results of this recommendation have just been published, a study comparing thousands of women having their babies in hospital with women having a planned birth at home. Miranda Davies-Tuck was the lead author. Miranda is a perinatal epidemiologist at the Hudson Institute in Melbourne. Welcome to the Health Report, Miranda. Oh, hello. Thank you for having me. Now this You took data from 15 years. It was an impressive number of women. Uh, 16 years, 2000 to 2015. Sorry, inclusive. maths was never my strong point. <laughs> so, how yeah, many, so you were comparing women who went for home births to women who went into hospital. What sort of numbers are we talking about here? So there are around 4,000 women who plan to home birth and uh, just over 800,000 who plan to give birth in hospital. And we're saying planned because these aren't women who couldn't get to hospital and had the baby at home. These were women who just wanted to have a private delivery from a midwife. Yes, so these were women who had made a decision at the onset of their labour um, to, to plan to give birth either at home or in hospital. How did you do the study? What, what were you looking for and how did you compare the two sets of women? So we used the routinely collected data um, that we have for Victoria. So every time a baby is born or a woman is pregnant in Victoria, a whole host of information is collected and reported to the Department of Health so that we can monitor the health of women and babies in Victoria. And so we access that data to compare the outcomes after we classified them as either uh, planning to birth at home or planning to birth in hospital and whether they'd be deemed to be of high or low risk of having an adverse outcome. So describe a woman, a pregnant woman who's low risk and a woman who's high risk. What sort of factors are we talking about here? So generally speaking, a low risk woman is a woman who has a healthy pregnancy. There's nothing majorly wrong with her or her baby. There's only one baby that she's carrying. So she's not having twins and she hasn't had a previous complicated pregnancy. So one that's ended in a cesarean, for example. Um, in contrast, the women who would be considered or who were considered high risk were predominantly women who had had a prior caesarean delivery. They were also women who were giving birth beyond 42 weeks, so we call that post-term. And then there was a smaller subset of those women that had more than one baby whose baby was breached, so it wasn't head down or they had some sort of serious medical condition such as uh, hypertension, etc. Okay, so the, like for like but the difference was the home birth or not. I mean, was it truly like for like? I mean, were women having their babies at home more likely to be better educated, higher income? 
Yes, yeah, so we saw that regardless of whether they had risk factors or not, they tended to be healthier, um, older women of a higher socioeconomic um, standard if we use the what we call CFA, it's a way we categorise them. Um, it's not surprising though because the women choosing a home birth in this study were doing so privately, so they were paying out of pocket to do that. The, the type of risk factors were slightly different too. So the high-risk women in hospital were more likely to have medical conditions, um, which was a, a little bit higher than the women who planned to give birth at home. Before we get to the results, did that influence the results, do you think, or were you able to control for all that? So we made the decision not to control for anything in this study. We weren't interested in the relationship between home birth and outcome. But what we wanted to do was to provide information in a, in a way that women would be able to work out where they sat in that particular group and then make decisions about um, what their outcome rates would be if they did or didn't um, have risk factors and if they chose to give birth in home or hospital. So what did you find? Um, so that we found that for the low risk women, there were no differences in um, perinatal death. So babies were not more likely to die for women without risk factors planning to give birth at, at home. So when you say um, perinatal, is that the first week of life? Or? So perinatal death includes stillbirths that occur during labour and also deaths um, in the first 28 days of life. Okay. So, so no, no difference in perinatal death? What, what, uh, so what yeah. about other baby outcomes? So um, in terms of some of the morbidities or the bad things that can happen to babies, some of these were actually lower for the women who plan to give birth at home. So their babies were less likely to have an injury um, and they were less likely... Um, to have some of the other morbidities that can occur. But this probably reflects differences in some of the intervention rates that the low-risk women... So they were less likely to have instrumental deliveries and caesarean deliveries, um, so possibly it could be related to that. What about the high-risk women? So for the high-risk women, we didn't see that the perinatal mortality rates was the same. In fact, we saw that... You got uh, a tripling, didn't you? Um, no, it was actually seven times more likely to have their baby die if they planned seven to give birth at home. Yes, so neonatal death was the... So death after the baby was born was the, the death rate that was significantly higher in the women... For what reason? Give. I mean, there wouldn't be been large numbers, but what reason? No, so the numbers were very small. We can... Um, it's, it's difficult to to talk about the, the drivers of this because the numbers are so small. But it did look like um, the babies that were born at home were the ones that died. These were not the babies that transferred to, to hospital during labour. So if you got into problems with a planned delivery and you transferred to hospital, you were okay. It was just if you, you, you got into strife, then that's the women who got into problems with their babies. Yeah, um, and potentially there were barriers to... Um, barriers to the transfer to hospital, whether or not those barriers still exist right now, um, we can't be certain. But, but all the maternal benefits and the other benefits were there in the high-risk women. It, it was only that risk of uh, perinatal death that was the issue. Now, um, there are all sorts of... So, so in other words, it's basically good news as long as you've got your risk as assessed and you're going into this with your eyes open. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really good that we've been able to show for Victoria what uh, we already know for international studies. So the UK data has been telling us this for a long time, but we didn't have any data to inform us here. So it's good to see that what we're seeing here is the same as what they're seeing in the other big studies internationally. Now, there are big issues here. You know, midwives are supposed to have an obstetrician who covers them and, um, and they're trying, they, they often find it hard to find an obstetrician who's prepared to cover the midwife and look after them. The midwife feels that they're not easily able to transfer the baby, there's a problem with payment and insurance, getting uh, indemnity insurance. Are we overcoming those barriers yet? Yes and no. I, I think certainly a lot of the barriers to transfer um, are decreasing. We have collaborative arrangements now where um, hopefully midwives are feeling comfortable backing up and consulting with obstetric staff when women need um, care. Certainly we see from the data that we have that when a woman has been identified as needing to transfer and transfers to hospital, her outcomes are fine. So in those instances, absolutely. And just very finally, very briefly, because we're well over time, um, is this applicable to other jurisdictions in Australia, do you think? Um, I would say yes. In addition that is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.